what we're going to do is talk to you about how um, we think board culture can drive um, organisational success and we're going to take a little bit of a slice of uh, RISE history. Um, I'm going to introduce some segments and Patrick's going to talk about them. So we're going to talk about what the board was like in 2009, some of the issues there, some of the changes that were implemented um, and what the board is like now and the enormous difference it's made to the organisation. So we hope that we can pass on some really practical tips of things that made a difference. So um, just before I start, I'll give a little bit of an overview about RISE. So RISE used to be called Hills Community Support Group. It was around for 30 years. Many people may know it's first and only prior to me um, founding CEO Helen Dullard. We provide um, accommodation and support for people with a disability, mental <coughs> health issues, youth at risk and the aged, and their carers. So unlike some organisations here, we're very diverse. Uh, we have about 2,000 clients a year, nearly 400 staff, 100 volunteers, and we've got a turnover of $22 million. So we're, we're quite a large organisation, but again, a aged care, um, is a significant part of our organisation and makes up by far the greatest number of our clients. So Patrick is going to kick off with um, what the board was like in 2009. Yeah, okay, when I uh, jo uh, joined the board in 2009, um, we didn't have a full complement. The constitutional allowance was for 12 members and we had eight at that stage. At that stage, it was a different ball game. I mean, how, what's that, four or five years ago? Mm -hmm. It was like, it was so hard to get people on your board. Uh, they just, um, uh, and sometimes people stayed there forever. You just couldn't find replacements for, on, on your not-for-profit uh, for, for board. And I'm sure that uh, you all know what I'm talking about. It's thankfully changed. And I'll talk about maybe some of the reasons why uh, a little later on. Um, <clears throat> the situation in 2009 was that the board itself felt it had the responsibility to bring in new members. Okay, that's the first thing. Most suggestions in the end came from the CEO, so it was a bit limited. Uh, it, it resulted in some excellent members and um, also there were some decisions that could have been better perhaps. Uh, <coughs> At this time also with our board, just keep in mind what Justine said we do, we're quite diverse, we do a whole lot of things that are not quite just aged care. Uh, at this time it was felt that we needed representation from the industry or, the, or from the uh, community sector on our board, so we, we did that, we had that. It didn't always work out that well, conflict of interest uh, issues arose and uh, e even drifted down to staff feeling that they weren't represented properly because they didn't have a representation on the board. So it was a little bit of a problem and it created a sort of an imbalance within the board. Uh, so, and that could be particular to us, not, not you guys, but that, that was just one thing that was in, in, in place. So we made a conscious effort actually to avoid that sort of board representation. Um, and we also said, well, that a lot of that expertise is in the organisation, in our leadership team anyway. And uh, it, since we've done that, we've certainly had no negative um, uh, from, from actually making that, uh, that's, that happen. Okay, you're going to talk about the next bit? So, yeah, so that, that was some of the... Some That's of the, the context issues, yeah. for you. So I suppose with those things, it had um, uh, quite an impact on the organisational success, which is the link we're trying to draw. Um, and there was probably, with, with um, those sort of representatives on the board, more of a focus on the board being involved in operational <coughs> matters, say, probably rather than broader business and strategic matters. Um, what we thought was... Um, um, ha um, having people on a board or getting people to uh, join a board and stay on a board is really not too dissimilar from the strategies you might use to attract and retain staff, something we're all massively familiar with. Um, it's hard work when you've got with someone you want to just chain them to something so they can't leave. Um, you, you know, it's really hard managing the turnover. So we now go through a process um, when a vacancy comes up about how we tackle it. So we're going to do one step at a time. So the first step we do is identify <coughs> our requirements and Patrick's going to talk about how we do that. Okay, so a good board culture is not dissimilar to a good organisational culture. Uh, there's a big focus in what we do on good attraction and retention strategies um, and we're going to take you through that process. First thing of course to do, last time we did our strategic plan was in 2010 
Um, so the first thing you've really got to do before you do any of this is review your strategic, strategic direction. And we're just going through that process right now because it doesn't make sense to um, have a brand new plan or an old plan uh, where you're not uh, focusing. The needs change, what I'm trying to say is the needs have changed from 2010 to now immensely actually. Uh, so you really need to um, update your skill set of, of what you require for your board. So the first thing is re uh, review your strategic direction, it was for us anyway. Uh, identify the skill set that we, you, we require and already have and it was really interesting when I looked at uh, our school set for 2010 that we looked at, that I looked at. And I've done some research since then to see what's out there and I find that the one that I quite liked on this one is entirely different. From 2009 to 2013, there's so many different things that we really need to look at. And one is these things, of course, IT, social media, all of that sort of stuff that's come to, f come to f before since 2009. So your needs on your board change. And that's why you've got to review your, 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 your direction so that you know what your needs are. Um, <clears throat> so, for instance, we, we think we're now to look at education, uh, professional, political, fundraising, social inclusion agenda, uh, marketing and digital, digital media. That was something that wasn't around in 2009, not at the level it is now anyway. Legal governance, risk management, accounting, strategy growth management, program delivery and management, operation systems and policy development, human resources, technically, uh, technology and IT systems, and it goes on and on. I won't bore you with going on with it for so long. But those are all of the things that you need to look at when you're building a, a school skill set matrix. Because what we find is um, once you can't go out and seek a board member unless you know what skills you need. So you've got to do, you identify what skills you need, you identify what you've got on the board already, and then you really know <coughs> what you're looking for next, which leads into the next thing, which is advertise the position. So unless you know what you're actually asking for, just asking for a, do that or want a board <coughs> member, knowing that helps us really tailor our, uh, what we're advertising. And Patrick will now say how we go about advertising that position. Yeah, okay, we treat it exactly like uh, if you uh, putting up a position in your organisation. We do exactly the same thing. In fact, we have developed a template for board positions. We have a de description template that we use as a basis. We tailor that if we're looking for certain things. You, know, you maybe wouldn't quite, if you wanted a lawyer, you would may make it different from somebody if you wanted expertise in marketing. So, But as a basic template, it's there. Uh, so what do you do um, <clears throat> when you've got that? How do you get it out there? I have to actually put a uh, plug in for Wacos because they did a wonderful, which I found very useful, succession planning becoming future proof. Did that a couple of years ago. And uh, they had some great tips on how you, how you get out there. They, gave you, they actually give you websites and all sorts of things that you can put your advert on. So uh, word of mouth, still very important. Um, feedback from your board, that's the, you know, you might get some people from your board. Difference between the old in 2009 was that's all I was getting, board or the CEO. Now that feedback that you get for recommendation for your board would be only one aspect that you would use in the whole, in the whole way of doing things. So websites, uh, going on websites, especially your own, local paper, um, there's uh, a thing that the AICD do, do, which for, for one of a better word, I think it's a net, they use networking, but we were using speed dating. Mm -hmm. And actually we, uh, <coughs> where uh, uh, AICD get people that want to be on boards, people that from not-for-profits that uh, need board members, you get together, you talk to them for 10, 20 minutes. Five minutes, sell your pitch. Five minutes, the next yeah, sell. And so Justine went to one of those, and we actually picked up a very good board member that way, Terry, which was uh, <coughs> was uh, terrific. So that's that's one way of doing it. Um, and then the other thing that's changed, I said that the, the whole way of doing things has changed since 2009. We've actually had companies approach us. And the reason for that is, I think, is that that triple bottom line, you know, that social um, uh, dividend that, that firms want now. So, and it's great because people come in 
really fired up about doing some social good. So they're really in the, you've got their heads in the right space to start with. So we also picked up a very good board member uh, that way. Uh, <coughs> and um, uh, so that the, the company's actually approached us. So it's a lot easier, I think, to, to, to get <coughs> members now than what it was in 2009, where everyone seemed to stay away from the not-for-profit sector. Um, local government websites, that's another way you can advertise uh, that you're, uh, where you're going. I've got a whole stack of things in there which I don't mind actually getting printed up and giving to people. A lot of websites, be silly to go into them now. Uh, but, and contact, ways that you can contact to get your advert out there to the... Uh, and hopefully what you'll have is a pool of candidates for your positions. We have two positions coming up on our board in October this year. We'll start in August, um, setting up our ads, getting it out there, and hopefully we'll be able to interview a number of candidates, and we'll talk a little bit later on about the next step. But um, the other, another good thing that I think worth mentioning is university career centres, and emerging candidates coming out of, uh, out of the universities, that's a great place to put, get your ad in. Um, <coughs> And uh, you can headhunt, of course, for specialists. If you want a lawyer, you can just go out and headhunt and find people that, uh, that have one that you think might be useful. Um, so that's, that's the different ways. Lots of other things I, I could go into, but I won't. I haven't got the time, really. Um, another couple of really, really good ones that we use often is Leadership WA and Women on Boards as well, yeah. so I would definitely recommend those. So assuming you've then got your a pool of um, skilled, interested candidates coming to you, the next step we do is to actually brief the candidates. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, the first step, step with that is uh, we send them out a briefing pack, of course, and uh, on the organisation before you meet, and uh, it has an organisational overview of the organisation, so you give them all the basic facts about what you do and what it's all about, send that out to them, then I meet with them, um, and it's a very informal chat, it's not too, um, and then find out uh, what, um, what, they, what they want to get out of it, and also I want to know what they're going to bring to the board, what skills and what, uh, uh, what, what, what they can actually uh, uh, contribute to the organisation. It's a sort of warts and all conversation. It's a great way if it's informal because you can really get down to that. Well, you know, um, you, you know, we have um, just like Graham and Julian, we have subcommittees, so you're expected to serve on those, and you know the hours of this, and you know sometimes meetings do go over. We try to keep them to two hours, but the last one didn't. So, you know, there is all of that sort of thing. So you can have that warts and all, and they can ask you questions too, uh, and you get a good feel of what the person's commitment might be and what they are going to give to the organisation. So that's the yeah, And I'd say that's particularly important. Sometimes I will go along with Patrick as well to meet the candidate because if you're going to have someone to come onto your board and you expect them to make a real difference in a diverse and complex organisation, you need to give them the information they can't read on the balance sheet in your annual report because that's the stuff you want to sell. Um, this is the, we are struggling with workers' comp a little bit. There are some cultural issues, those kind of things that you probably wouldn't put on the front page of your annual report with a grinning client, but we want to be able to share with potential board members because there's no point in hoodwinking them. So having briefed them, the next step is interviewing and selecting the candidates. Okay, the next thing is what we do is invite them to a board meeting and uh, they, uh, they can absorb, uh, observe how the meeting, it's just a normal meeting, it's not tailored to them. Uh, but they can also ask questions. We leave time within that um, uh, board meeting for them to ask questions. And it gives a feel for the whole board then to get a feel. It's just not me and Justine. Everyone gets a look at them. Um, <coughs> uh, I then contact them again and discuss any issues that are, may have been raised by the board members or whatever and talk through some of the issues and, and try to find tune uh, how they feel and also take on board how the board feels about that person themselves. Um, then uh, after that is done the board makes a decision on whether that person can be uh, a suitable candidate for the, for the um, organisation. 
and, whether, and then whether they want to join as well. I That's think right. we've got, gone past the time of, you know, we, the, particularly the, the, the high calibre of people we're looking to attract now, it's really quite possible that they might look at us and go, thanks but no thanks. And I think we need to be aware of that and be um, present ourselves very well. It's a, it's a mutual agreement. It's not just you should be grateful to be on our board. Um, they might turn around and say no thank you. So it's, a, it's like an interview process. So <coughs> assuming they like us and they join and they, um, they could join the board, then what do we do to retain <coughs> the candidate? Because having gone through all of that, you want them to stay on the board and make it as valuable and interesting for them as possible. Okay, so virtually we have to, we, we use the Carver model of governance. Justin calls Carver, Carver light because it is rather intense when you read that book. Uh, but it's uh, one of those important things is the separation between strategic and operational matters being brought up already today. And uh, the board strictly deals with the strategic matters. Anything to do with operational must go through the CEO. Uh, also, we um, retain our board members. We uh, expect them to contribute. Um, they, they contribute us, uh, on board, uh, subcommittees. Uh, board appraisals, which is something we do regularly. At the moment, it's working out at about every two years, we do a board appraisal. Um, and by getting buy-in and subcommittees, where you're getting people to actually do something instead of coming to a meeting where they take some half the meeting to orientate themselves and figure out what's going on, they're actually involved in something and it does make a big difference to that commitment. So those subcommittees work very well. We give them a full induction of all the aspects of the organisation. We visit all the sites and um, we also get them in with our leadership team so that they can get that perspective from inside the organisation. Uh, we have a board policy and uh, a manual code of ethics. Uh, the subcommittees we run, um, similar to what Graham and Julian uh, have, we have finance, governance, marketing, which is a new one, uh, strategic asset management and risk management. It's the way that we uh, handle our um, subcommittees. As I said, we have regular board uh, appraisals um, and papers. We make sure little things like this can really help your board function well too. Make sure we get you, because these are busy people, get your papers out to them a week ahead of the time. They must be well organised and easy to read. And there, you, I always have that expectation that if a person is not going to come to a meeting, that they should that it won't, uh, apology will not be accepted unless they contact me and give me their feedback on the papers that have been given. If they don't do that, well, then the, the apology is not, not accepted. So in other words, I want them to still <laughs> give us some feedback even though they can't be there. Um, <clears throat> I think it's very important that the chair uh, develops a culture of mutual, uh, mutual res uh, respect within the board. And you, you you have to be careful as a chair with the use of language and ensuring that all board members feel that they can contribute f freely because that's when you really get the gold. When people feel they can stand up and say, this might be a silly question, but because often those, those are gold. And if they don't feel free, if it's in a very formal organisation, you don't get that, that result. Um, I suppose that's the... Um in summary then, it's, it, the, that's had a massive change in terms of the type of people we have on the board. So we've probably gone from <coughs> very um, sector representative, more kind of kitchen table type board members to <coughs> the people we have on the board now um, aren't so much involved or knowledgeable about the sector because there's 400 people inside the organisation who live and breathe it. What they do is bring in and they run the business and develop the strategy. So we have people who are in property development, we have a senior risk director uh, who works on the Kell Gorgon joint venture, we have a government lobbyist, um, we have someone who's just embarking on their old, own gold exploration company. So these are people with business heads on who aren't interested in dabbling in the detail because they don't work with a person with disability. They've got the passion to get it right, but they will bring the strategy, the business and the commercial acumen to drive it forward. Um, what I find from a CEO point of view, it's a highly respectful relationship. They really don't dabble, even when there are some very tricky things going on in the organisation. I inform them out of courtesy to the board of some tricky things, but in, in no way do they ever interfere. They're very clear about what's my responsibility and role and what's theirs. 
Um, I'm in turn incredibly honest with them, so I let them know what's going on. I, if I mess up, I fess up, sort of thing, and, and they repay that respect by, by not interfering. It. I, just, I think it works incredibly well, and I suppose what happens now um, in terms of organisational success, we now have a full complement of 12 board members, a wide variety of skills, when you're struggling to get nine. Um, they're incredibly highly skilled, there's great succession plans in place, they're driving some amazing strategy. I'm bleeding from the ears from the amount of work they give me now. It was when I started 18 months ago, I could have put some stuff in front of them and they probably weren't as informed as they are now. So now, you know, we've, we've turned it around and so you've got to be careful what you wish for because I'm now working 500 times harder. But my God, you know, they, look, they read the papers, it's brilliant. <coughs> My former boss from my previous organisation is on the board and he can be relied on to find that typo in page 54 and I think at least he's read the papers. So you've actually, we've got some amazing people now headed by Patrick who just guides them all to just, just develop the most incredible strategy. Um, they're highly functional group dynamic. It's, it's, really, it's really very much changed the culture of the organisation. We're much more success and results driven. Um, they're very highly respected inside and outside the organisation. So in that little time, Patrick, I think, has turned the nature of the board round and how, how we recruit board members, and it's had a major difference. And it's through following yeah. those steps, I'd say, and taking it quite seriously that that's where we are now. I do also, just to add a couple of things, thanks. <laughs> so a couple of things just to add to the success too, I think, is as a board chair, time is really important. Meetings that drag on too long, really get, uh, you just see them glaze over. Two hours maximum, that's all you can really get. These people have worked hard all day and you, you can't expect too much more out of them. So I try to really keep, I failed the last meeting, but usually I try to keep it to that. Uh, uh, great thing that I like about the board is the open and honest discussions and there's a great lack of ego, which is fantastic because ego can get in the way, as we all know. Um, and all the other, just another thing, we use the leadership team to service the subcommittees so that the board members aren't expected to do the grunt work, that they come up with the ideas, do all of this, and the leadership, you have somebody assigned from the leadership team. It's great for the leadership team, they can see how the board works, etc., etc. So that works, uh, that works very well as well. That's about it. Is there some sort of techno gizmo <coughs> supposed to beam up our question or something? <laughs> something. Um. Oh. Yes. So, uh, oh, we yeah. need to ask some questions. Is that what, what yeah. we're doing? Is that yeah, definitely. Yeah. Do you want to spend five minutes doing that? Or yes. Answering questions? Yeah. 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 Put it up. Oh, that? I don't know. Yeah. So we handed a couple of questions over. Yeah. We gave a couple of questions yeah, in advance. So I didn't know if I was supposed to press something. I'll put yeah. it up. Or if anyone had any questions before you start. And this might be good anyway. Sorry, yeah. just before we start. What, the questions we put up might, might give you something to you. Yeah. Want, you know, I mean, people have got it on their own. Oh, they don't necessarily have it up on the screen. Oh, okay. I just wasn't sure if everyone had access <coughs> to them. So the, uh, yeah, um, yeah, I'll just the password is Crimson Pony for this one. Mm. <laughs> I didn't come up with these. I'm not Someone had a late yeah. night coming up with these passwords. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. I was going to change it to who comes up with these passwords, but that's not the real password. <laughs> A uh, question I have is, I'm interested in the, uh, the appraisal process for the board. How wide uh, spread is the input to that process, as in who's involved? Yeah, um, we've always used the, well, we, we started off, our first one was a self-assessment, and we actually used an internet, uh, which was amazing, because the average age at that stage was still 60. We managed to get the internet working for us, and used uh, an American, um, questionnaire as a basis, which is still internal, we did ourselves. The next one we did, we brought in an external facilitator. Uh, no, really he was an observer. He wasn't a facilitator. He just observed the way we went through the process and made comment. That was very useful actually. And he was outside the sector, but he, once again, getting that extra, that head, that new head in, and somebody that, you know, was thinking in a, in a different space, gave us lots of ideas. and. Uh, and really helped us. I, I guess where I'm coming from is, was, the, was it still within the board or did you go out to your clients or did you go out to your staff? It was within the board. Okay, that answers that question, thank you. But something, well, I suppose the, yeah. the, the relevant thing is here, having done, this started before <coughs> I joined, um, 
having done a self a self assessment, which still happens every year, having had an external observer on, what I think the board's really seriously looking at now is what next. Um, what is the next step to do to, to you know, to the next obvious step in appraisal? And it's d looking at things like that. How do we do it? And it's been that's actually been one of our challenges, which should have been one of our questions, I guess. What is what is the best model of board appraisal? Because this is something we talk about quite regularly, and it seems to either get us some sort of Uber KPMG hundred thousand dollar consultant uh. model answer, or a <coughs> or download a sort of tick your own questionnaire off the internet thing. It's, it's, yeah. it's a struggle to get somewhere in between that might encourage, yeah. yeah. So if you've got any bright ideas, feel free to let us know. Yeah, to be quite honest, we, we start off with a model of a, first year would be self-assessment. Um, Second year would be a facilitated assessment. Third year would be totally outside. In other words, you get you know an outside person to come in and structure the whole assessment and do the whole thing. Uh, but uh, that third option, number one, turned out to be when we started looking at it, absolutely beyond our price range. It was just huge. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and secondly, as has been said to me a couple of times, it's a lot like trying to crack a walnut with a hammer, you know, like it was just too much. And so we're sort of now trying to find that middle ground where we can get some good feedback. Um, and on the, the best thing, I think the main thing is do it. it will, no matter what you do, you just must keep doing it. So I think though, my thinking now, having gone through that cycle, is probably every two years, it's my personally, we haven't decided that in the board, but I think every two years rather than every year. Um, but it is a great thing. It really brings your board back on track and you get a lot of good, especially if you have somebody from outside, you get some good feedback. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I just <coughs> to ask you, uh, I've sat on numerous boards and I've found that the boards that function in a way where they have an executive, so you've got your chair, your vice chair, your treasurer and um, yep. another, and they, they seem to have a separate email address, they get different information and that's not always shared with the rest of the board and I find it quite frustrating. And I just wonder, is there anyone else in the room that uh, functions under that kind of board and how do you crack that? Because I, I don't agree with that. And even, it it you know, might go back to your constitution. <coughs> yeah. You might have to look at the way that was set up mm. and uh, they may be doing that because that's just the way that the constitution mm. says it's got to be done. So that'd be the first. Yeah, I've done that. It's not in the constitution. Mm -hmm. they, the chair just decided it. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you give to a smaller organisation trying to attract highly skilled board members? That's a good question. Well, it's interesting actually because one of our our vice chair who's stepping down, um, or has just stepped down as vice chair, specifically <coughs> asked me every other day give me the name of a small organisation I can support. Oh, so if only you'd have said Yakwa too late, yeah. it's angel hands. Because so <laughs> 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 um, um, I'm on a small board myself, so I'm on a board for Social Innovation in WA, four people started. Um, I, I think it's about, um, to me being on a board, is it's about the ability to make a difference. Um, and I think that's what's sexy and exciting. Um, are you gonna come in in the two hours when you could be having a glass of wine and walking your dog, you're instead sitting in a room with you know, other people, are you gonna walk out there and make a difference? And I think in a small board, if it's done the right way, you can, make, you can feel like you've made an enormous difference because um, you can go in there and impart knowledge that the small board weeps to have there, you know, it's great. So I think that's how you can do it. So you don't want to look flaky, I guess. Um, you want to reassure them that there will be some structure and process. But, you know, well, you can be a big fish in a small pond, and that's what some people quite like to do, without the ego. But, yeah, if you, if you can convince them that you'll run it well, then they've got an ability to make a significant difference. So I reckon I think it's quite exciting. I think also that, you know, as a small organisation, you just do that business about being very professional the way you do it. Yes. Yeah. You know, like, as I said, advertise. Put as much time into your board position as you would into a position in the organisation yeah. and go out and interview. You know, do it, do, yeah. do it that way. That also does another thing. It tells the person, people that you're professional. Yeah, that you absolutely. know what you're doing. And if you do that, um, you'll attract the people to your board. Mm. Yeah. Yeah.
Well, I might have to conclude it there. I know that this sort of topic doesn't get discussed enough, I don't think. There's not enough forums where we can actually come together as leaders and board members and really discuss what's working for each other and how we can all do it better. I would like to commend both Patrick and, and Justine for being huge supporters of, of this project. Since the very beginning, they've always been willing to come to our events, lend their support in any way possible, and it's, it's really appreciated from our perspective because, you know, not everybody has jumped on board so quickly and that only now where we're actually seeing so many organisations come out of the woodworks and really support this organisation. I just really want to commend and recognise you guys for being one of the first to actually really support this project. Um, and I, I again want to appreciate your time and effort in putting together this fantastic presentation for us today. So let's please thank them for